Good afternoon. afternoon. On this day, as our country somberly remembers events from 12 years ago, on this day, as our country threatens to attack another country, on this day, as people all over the world and right here in this country experience terror by many hands. On this day, when children, men, and women are hungry and without shelter. On this day, when we continue practices that strip our planet of sustainability. On this day, we acknowledge our complicity and we acknowledge the need for leaders who will create spaces for new life to spring forth. So, it is appropriate that we celebrate our opening convocation on this day, a long and rich tradition at Chicago Theological Seminary, the official beginning of our academic year, a time when we greet new and returning members of this community and we focus on our mission at CTS to rigorously prepare women and men as leaders for reformation and transformation of society toward greater justice and mercy. Therefore, it is my honor to welcome you to the 158th academic year. Welcome all. Welcome to staff members who have been working here all summer preparing for this academic year. Welcome back returning students and faculty. I hope you've had a peaceful and productive summer and that you've returned refreshed and ready to go. Welcome to our incoming class. If you are a member of the incoming class, and you're watching us, please wave. And if you're here, please wave. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> Welcome as your life's journey takes this new turn in joining with this community, and we will all be transformed. Welcome to alums who are in the house today, even from long and far away or from right here in Chicago. Welcome to board members. Welcome to those joining us virtually. Welcome to all who join in this service today. In the air, we rightly note a sense of solemn responsibility, along with a sense of anticipation and creative energy. We formally recognize that today with our opening convocation. We celebrate a continuing focus on excellence as we contemplate the possibilities for good in this year. On behalf of Don Clark, our trustee chair, I also bring the welcome of the trustees to each of you. We celebrate your thirst for wisdom and your search for courage. We celebrate your presence and your willingness to give yourselves to ministry and to religious leadership. You make us very proud and you give us purpose when we know that you are doing the very thing that so many have done before you. May God be with you and may this year be a good year. This year on this day in a country that celebrates dates Sometimes the best way to remember a special day is to think of courage and wisdom and God's grace. Good afternoon. A convocation is literally a gathering or assembly, and at CTS we gather several times a year to mark that part of our life together which is devoted to learning, teaching, writing, and research. Our academic events this semester include the annual C. Shelby Rooks Lecture, which is dedicated to the life and work of Reverend Dr. C. Shelby Rooks, 
who became the first African-American president of a predominantly white theological school in the United States when he served as CTS president from 1974 to 1984. This year's Rooks lecture will be given by Dr. Jonathan Walton from Harvard Divinity School. We hope that you will join us on Thursday, October 10th, when Dr. Walton will be lecturing on the Du Boisian Dilemma, Sacrificing Faith in Order to Save the Race. And watch for announcements about other events that week, sponsored by our Center for the Study of Black Faith and Life, which is being chaired this year by Professor Joanne Terrell. I am also happy to announce that Exploration Press has published a book by our professor of biblical and constructive theology, Theodore Jennings, which is entitled An Ethics of Queer Sex, Principles and Improvisations. The volume was written with support from a grant from the Arcus Foundation and with input from our own Dr. Scott Haldeman, a distinguished advisory committee, and numerous students from Professor Jennings' courses in queer ethics. And speaking of academic grants, this summer we learned that the Center for Jewish, Christian, and Islamic Studies has received a new grant from the Henry Luce Foundation titled Ecommunity, the Ecology of Theological Education in a Religiously Pluralistic World. The grant will combine the seminary's long-standing commitment to interreligious education and community engagement with environmental justice and sustainability. And I encourage you to watch for announcements about new initiatives funded by the grant. Two members of our faculty are on sabbatical this semester. Dr. Julia Speller, Associate Professor of Re American Religious History and Culture, and Dr. Sing A. Yang, Associate Professor of New Testament. And we welcome back from sabbatical three members of our full-time faculty, Dr. Susan Brooks Thistlethwaite, Professor of Theology, Dr. Bom Young So, Associate Professor of Theology and Cultural Criticism, and Dr. Rachel Mikva, Rabbi Herman Shaman, Assistant Professor of Jewish Studies. Professor Mikva will be speaking to us at another convocation on Wednesday, October 23rd. Professor So will be speaking to us at a third convocation on February 12th. And our speaker for today is Professor Thistlethwaite. Dr. Susan Brooks Thistlethwaite first came to CTS in 1982 after earning her MDiv and PhD at Duke University and teaching at Wesley Theological Seminary. Professor Thistlethwaite is an ordained minister of the United Church of Christ, and in the years surrounding her arrival at CTS, she participated in a UCC Peace Theology Development Team, formed as part of the process that led the General Synod in 1985 to affirm the UCC's commitment to being a just peace church. In addition to editing a volume titled A Just Peace Church, which emerged from the team's work, Professor Thistlethwaite has written and edited many other books, including Metaphors for the Contemporary Church, Sex, Race, and God, Christian Feminism in Black and White, Lift Every Voice, Constructing Christian Theologies from the Underside, Casting Stones, Prostitution and Liberation in Asia and the United States, The New Testament and Psalms, an Inclusive Version, Adam, Eve, and the Genome, and Occupy the Bible. From 1998 to 2008, Professor Thistlethwaite served as the 11th president of CTS. From her arrival at CTS until today, she has never lost her passion for a public theology of just peacemaking and of women's equality. And we look forward to hearing her bring those concerns together again as she addresses us today on the topic, Women's Bodies as Battlefield, Just War, Just Peace, and the Global War on Women. A reading from the color purple. Here's the thing, say Shug, the thing I believe. God is inside you and inside everybody else. You come into the world with God, but only them that search inside find it. It? I asked. Yeah, it. God ain't a he or a she, but a it. But what do it look like? I asked. Don't look like nothing, she say. It ain't a picture show. It ain't something you can look at apart from everything else, including yourself. I believe God is everything, say Shug. Everything that is or was or ever will be. And when you can feel that and be happy to feel that, you've found it. 
My first step from the old white man was trees, then air, then birds, then other people. But one day, when I was sitting quiet and feeling like a motherless child, which I was, it come to me. That feeling of being part of everything, not separate at all. I knew that if I cut a tree, my arm would bleed. And I laughed and I cried and I run all around the house. I knew just what it was. Here ends the reading. Please join me in prayer. Dearest God, who defies all our attempts at description and imagination, remind us now that you are already here. Help us as we search for you, rediscover you, share you with each other. And when we have found you for the first time or all over again, may we know, just know, that we are part of everything, not separate at all. In the name of God with us, I pray. Amen. War is never a good idea. A picture poem for children blinded in war. The war speaks every language. It never knows what to say to frogs. Picture frogs beside a pond holding their annual pre-rainy season convention. They do not see war, huge tires of a camouflaged vehicle about to squash them flat. The war has eyes of its own and can see oil and gas and mahogany trees and every shining thing under the earth. When it comes to nursing mothers, it is blind. Milk especially human, it cannot see. Picture a woman beside a window. She is blissful, singing a lullaby. A baby twirls a lock of her hair, suckles for all it's worth. They do not smell war, dressed in green and brown, imitating their fields, marching slowly toward them up the steep hill. The war is old. It has not become wise. It will not hesitate to destroy things that do not belong to it. Things very much older than itself. Picture the forest 
with its rivers and rocks, its pumas, its parakeets, its turtles, leopards, and snakes. High above them, war has turned itself into a white cloud, trailing an airplane that dusts everything below with powder that kills. War tastes terrible and smells bad. It never considers body odor or weird side effects. When added to water, it makes you sick. Sip by sip. You could die while choking and holding your nose. Now suppose you become war. It happens to some of the nicest people on earth. And one day, you have to drink the water in this place. The scripture reading today is from Luke 1, 46 through 55, the Magnificat, Mary's song of praise, following the angel of the Lord's visitation. And Mary sang, my soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me, and holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lonely. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy according to the promise he gave to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants forever. Hello, CTS. And all the friends online. Thank you, Alice, for recognizing this is 9 11. And I would like to say thank you to everyone who today is participating in the National Day of Service of Remembrance. In my view, that is a just peace practice to respond to violence with service. This is what I did on my sabbatical. I started this book. I have said, in response to Susan Brown Miller's statement, rapists are the shock troops of pa patriarchy, that batterers are the army of occupation. All day long, all night long, every day, every night, the bodies of women and girls are turned into a battlefield. Their bodies are penetrated against their will. They are burned. They are maimed. They are bruised. They are slapped. They are kicked. They are threatened with a weapon. They are confined. They are beaten with fists and objects. They are knifed, shot. Their bones are broken. They lose limbs. They lose sight. They lose hearing, they lose pregnancies, and their sense of personal and physical integrity can also be lost. They are terrorized and they are killed. This is a battlefield, and this is what battlefields are like. Bodies are damaged, flesh 
is ripped apart. Minds, lives are destroyed. Eric Maria Remarque, in his very famous All Quiet on the Western Front, shocked Europe out of its heroic delusions of war in the vivid descriptions in that book of battlefields, including gassing. This unrelenting portrait of bodies locked in trench warfare, the battlefield in this novel is a gore-filled, body-destroying wasteland. Hay strikes his spade into the neck of a gigantic Frenchman and throws the first grenade. We duck behind a breastwork for a few seconds, and the straight bit of trench ahead of us is empty. The next throw whizzes obliquely over the cover and clears a passage. We run past, we toss handfuls down into the dugouts. The earth shudders, crashes, smokes, groans, and we stumble over slippery lumps of flesh, yielding bodies. I fall into the open body of an officer, his cap, new, sitting on top. Slippery lumps of flesh and yielding body, this is what war makes of bodies. Torn flesh and yielding bodies are also the experience of the war on women. It is very much the experience, for example, of rape. In 1984, Sherry Kurtz was a brand new recruit sent to Germany by the US military. She was gang raped by her brothers in arms. There are several triggers in this quotation that I have inserted into the draft of the book, and I am not going to read them out of respect for the experiences that we share here at Chicago Theological Seminary, both in our own personal experience and our commitments. If you wish to read this, I will share it with you. But I substituted a photograph. I'm using a lot of photographs in this book, as well as paintings, drawings, and other representations, because the representations of violence are an important part of how I am looking at this. And this is war-torn. A woman stands in a house destroyed by war. I thought it was particularly apt for today. And it is part of a Boston Museum of Fine Arts exhibit that is going on right now of Middle Eastern women's photographs. And where I can, I am using representations by women. To me, it is important to understand the war on women and war from the perspective of the body. Because body is where the carnage actually is. The damage to the body is the undeniable fact of violence. So too are the threats of violence, the memories of violence, that are carried not only physical body, but in the mind. Therefore, the actual physical violence is the one thing that has to be ignored, hidden, lied about, medicated, denied. Now, there are many models for looking at violence against women in the world we share. The World Health Organization just issued a multi-country study of violence against women. And they have published, it's a good study, I recommend you look it up online, that 35% of women and girls have experienced physical violence at least once in their lives. It's more than one in three. And they publish this as a health crisis, and they call it an epidemic. Critical data, important information, not what I am doing. It gives us a baseline calculus of the enormity of the problem we are up against, 
and it shows that it is a crisis. But I believe that staying with the body, staying with the injuring two bodies, exposes the gaping wound that is at the heart of this violence. The wounding of women, sometimes even to death, poses an existential crisis. And it is less easily dismissed than statistics. Though the drive to deny, dismiss, minimize, or probably personal favorite, justify injuring to women is rampant. So this is my body. The wounded, the bleeding, the maimed, the destroyed bodies of women, not negotiable. It is what it is. They are not the body in general. They are specific women's bodies. They are violated. They are wounded. They are sometimes destroyed. These are bodies that carry scars and memories. The body is the way we are in the world. And in the West, we've spent a whole lot of time trying to figure out how to get out of that. And women have been denigrated as the body, identified with the problem of embodiment. And embodiment itself denigrated as so a prison of the soul. But when we make the body the touchstone of what it means to be human, we can reshape this debate and we can make it change shape. Looking at women's bodies as battlefields is also crucial because they're not neutral bodies. They're some bodies. Some bodies, let's say in terms of race, sexual orientation, are more available to violation given other cultural norms. Everybody is at risk, but some are made more available. These are bodies that have been forced against our will, as Brown Miller so well said. Is it really a separation of body and spirit, or is it a separation of body and will? Is that the real dualism? The reality of women's bodies as battlefields connects the war on women to me with war. You know. It takes a lot of social and cultural and religious supports for 35% of women in the world to experience violence, and there isn't a complete uprising against that. Look around. Look around. In any congregation, in any assembly, in any group, any community you will be with, take that statistic with you. But why is there an outcry? But you know, that's a lot like the fact that we just up and think about sending healthy bodies of young people into war, where they will be maimed. They will have their bodies made into a battlefield. They will carry scars in their minds. They will be killed. How do we get to do that? and not have people in the streets every day saying, no, not my daughter, not my son, no. In this volume, I invented a theory. I combined strategic and physicality. Strategic essentialism from Spivak I think there's ways in which that's important to listen and learn from those who are thinking uh, outside the Western framework and from looking at physicality from Elaine Scarry's work on the body in pain. So I am positing there is a strategic physicality we need to apply to the war on women and to war. There's a lot of other stuff going on, but me, in this book, I'm focusing on injuring two bodies. I just stay with the body. I've got sections in this book on bleeding, on bruising, on loss of limbs, on, 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 
Stay with the body, don't look away. There's so much, so much that is trying to get us to look away. Also, I look at just war and just peace theory. How well have they done in terms of strategic physicality? Have they, in fact, paid sufficient attention to physicality? There's a lot on war. If you start to look, this is a series from the 19th century, Francisco Goya called the disasters of war. There's scenes from the Spanish struggle against Bonaparte, and this one is called They Don't Like It. There is a French soldier attempting to assault a Spanish woman, and this older Spanish woman is defending her. This is rare. This is very rare in the history of art. This series of etchings that Goya did, and, and there are scenes of war that are extraordinarily graphic in this series, showed war without pretense. There are two things that Elaine Scarry contributes to my thesis on the strategic physicality. One is that war is about injuring. The purpose of war is to injure the other side. That's, that's what you're trying to do, injuring and killing, injuring to death. And it's a reciprocal injuring. It's a contest. The one side that out injures the other side wins. Now you can say it's heroism, you can say it's goals and territory or resources, oil, as was read. <laughs> you know what? That's not what war is. That's what war is about. But war is out injuring the enemy. So when we consider women's bodies as battlefields, it comes into clearer view. War on women is about injuring women. But when it comes to the part of Scary's definition of war, i.e. it's a contest between two sides, who are the two sides in the war on women? It's not, in my view, a war between men and women. It is a war on women. Women's bodies are the battlefields over which some other contest is going on. Women in this, and you look at them in terms of just war theory, more play the role of non-combatants. Women are not equally authorized by their societies to use violence in the same way that men are authorized. Take, for example, this statistic. The average prison sentence for men who kill their intimate partners is two to six years. Whereas, the average prison sentence for women who kill their partners is 15 years. Who's authorized to use lethal violence and who is not? Consider the case of Marissa Alexander of Jacksonville, Florida. She received a 20-year prison sentence for firing a warning shot, shots, against her allegedly abusive husband. She had already taken a restraining order out of him, out on him, and she fired the warning shots to escape a brutal beating. She tried to use the stand your ground defense, and she was sent to jail for 20 years. What other case comes to mind in Florida that we might compare the sentencing. Women's bodies are the battlefields because that's where the violence takes place. But the contest is not with them, it's about them. The goal is establishing control over women through threat or actual violence. 
It is frequently a struggle for control among men, though there are other factors that need to be taken into account. There are aspects of both intimate violence, public violence, that fit into this framework. Women's bodies are the battlefields where violence takes place. So let's think about injuries and bodies. In this book, I start out by talking about injuring bodies and battlefields. This is not a fun book to write. I am spending time with veterans' accounts of their own injuries in war, of photos, films, Civil War photos, the first really extensively photographed war, up to and including wars that are going on today. And I look at the injuries. I try to invite the viewer in to looking at the injuries. Women's bodies, same framework. Part of what I have come to see much more clearly in working on this book is there's a ton of representation of violence against women in the public square, in art, in literature, in the newspaper. It's everywhere. So when people say to me, this is a hidden problem, <laughs> hidden from whom? But I develop a thesis of when we look, are we part of a witness group that is working to change this, or are we engaging in voyeurism? You can look, and you have different engagement with what you see. In addition, the overrepresentation of violence against women in the public square has the function of normalizing it, right? Robin Thicke's recent video comes to mind, right? Normalizing. So you've got seven-year-olds bopping down the street, listening to music about treating women violently. It's not a secret. It's not a secret. No secret. Normalized, enjoyed, made fun of. You know, no secret. No secrets. But we have to change our relationship to it. And one of the other theoretical formulas I use is we got to queer this. We must queer this. This cannot be normal. Not normal. Let's queer it. So those two chapters lay that out. History of the theologies of the body, sexism, and militarism. Uh, uh, you know, the, you know, I was meeting with the constructive students this morning. There's always plenty to say. You know what I mean? And so getting this to manageable chapter length is a challenge. But chapter three examines in greater depth the roots, the common roots of war and the war on women. And one of my ultimate theses in the book is that actually I think war today, and I use the example of the war in the Congo, and the war on women, war is actually starting to more resemble the war on women than even a quarter of a century ago. Now, we'll look away, right? We'll look away. There are a couple of ways in which we look away, and I think these are two different frames. We look away in war through the heroic fiction. I mean, after that's all, that's what Remark did, right? When he wrote All Quiet on the Western Front, he said, there is nothing heroic about this. Not one second of heroism. It's all blood and mud and terror and boredom. But it's heroically fictionized. But it's not the same in the war on women. In the war on women, you look away by eroticizing. Violence against women is eroticized. And so that's another way of looking and looking away. And uh, I've got both things on the screen. So in chapter six, just war. How well does just war do 
at limiting the war on women. Not at all. My colleague, Mary Potter Engel, with whom I did Lift Every Voice, wrote a really uh, remarkably groundbreaking book about how the war on women is a just war because it fulfills the criteria for authorizing war. So not only doesn't it stop the war on women, it authorizes it. But how well have we done in just peace? Has just peace, you know, architect here, you know, and being self-critical, critical of our movement, though we are growing and changing. Just peace was developed as a set of concrete practices that prevent or reduce violence and war and try to create a sustainable peace. But it lacks sufficient attention to the way in which war, in the war on women, is not a just peace. And it pays little attention to the denigration of the body. And I am going to propose an embodied just peace theology. After the Battle of Gettysburg, the dead, especially the Confederate dead, lay for days in the sun, the wind, and the rain, so they were hastily shoved into mass graves. And in the spring, at the thaw, the bodies or parts of the bodies would heave up out of the ground for years after Gettysburg. Now Lincoln came to Gettysburg and he said that the mass death at Gettysburg hallowed the ground as no dedication could do, for it was their deaths that provided the consecration. I am making the argument in this book that the ground at Gettysburg was not hallowed. This is a sacrilege. You follow what happens to bodies on the battlefield and how could you call that sacred? I love Lincoln's work. I think it's one of the biggest lies ever told by an American president. That's a lie. This wasn't sacred. This was sacrilege. But the bodies of women don't even get that, right? The places where they fall in death from rape or battering, they have no plaques, uh, no speeches, no consecrated ground. And their fatal injuries are not considered heroism, much of the time, it was their fault. But today, these fallen women's bodies are heaving up out of the ground. And they are demanding that their lives be valued, their loss mourned as a vast human atrocity, 35%. They shall not have died in vain if we commit ourselves to end the scourge of the war on women. Their suffering and their woundedness will not be hidden. It will not be excused. It will not be their fault. And all of the sisters around the world who live in fear and suffering inflicted on them, they too shall be valued and their value made plain so that women's bodies can no longer be the place where violence can be enacted and justified and even considered sacred. And you know what? Then we will call on what we do, peacemaking. And then, and only then, we can say we will study war no more. Thank you.
may be seated if you'll pray with me. Holy seeing God, we thank you that you see us. You see us in our bodies and you see us straight through to our souls. Oh God, let us feel you looking upon us now, knowing that there is strength inside us that is yet untapped, courage that we have not yet called upon, a burden that we may have ignored for too long. We begin with prayer, oh God, asking that you would bless these bodies, the ones in this room and the ones far beyond this place. We ask that you would bless women's bodies, being used now as battlefields, being fought on, over, but not for. Give us the courage, O oh God, to fight for women's bodies, to fight for all of our bodies. For when one of us is cut, we all bleed. Help us to remember this. And oh God, we thank you for another September 11th to start to get it right. We pray for peace today, God. We pray for wisdom. We pray for those whose bodies have been used in war to fight battles. For those who are proud of their service because they tried in their heart to do the right thing and to fight for the right cause. Bless our minds, God, that they may have peace, but more than that, that we may all now become peacemakers. Help us to go forward in your grace from under the sounds of the words that we've heard today, to go forward in courage, emboldened by the things that we have learned, to go forward in love, not ceasing until we can say for sure that we will study war no more. May your will be done on us, among us, and through us. I pray in Jesus' name, whom I believe with all my heart, is God putting on a body so that we could know that God cares for us. Amen. If you would, please stand for the recessional hymn, In the Midst of New Dimensions.
So get your peacemaker on and go in peace, do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with God. God bless you, each and every one. Amen.